everyone, to Krypton to Alderaan, the podcast that was said to destroy the Sith, <laughs> not join them. <laughs> I'm Joey, your Star Wars lover, and with me is Royish Good Looks. Hello, podcast. Robin, then that's it. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and Professor Dr. Lorelei. Hello. That's us, all right. This episode, we're finally going to be talking about Obi-Wan Kenobi Season 1 along with some of the stuff that was announced at D23, which is which was very exciting. So, let us know what you thought of Obi-Wan and what you think of what we thought of Obi-Wan <laughs> and what you're excited for coming out of D23. You can reach out with your feelings. You can just search Krypton to Alderaan on any social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and yes, even TikTok. I have ticked my first talk <laughs> officially. Or you can pew pew us an email at kryptontoalderon at gmail.com. And also, don't forget to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Please, just please, please go do that. And also, also, I made my first YouTube video. Woo! Well, asterisk on that, but it's there anyway. So please go check that out, like and subscribe and all that fun YouTube stuff. I had a lot of fun making it and I want to do more. So subscribe so you don't miss out on all my uh, simple tricks and nonsense. Awesome. That's my spiel. I'm making sure I'm following you on TikTok and we are already friends. It's not following. <laughs> We're friends. <laughs> yeah, you got to get the TikTok lingo down so we can continue to exist in this young person's space. Poke me back. <laughs> <laughs> Was that a Facebook thing? <laughs> was, yeah. that a, was that a MySpace thing? Facebook. That's a deep Are you cut. you in each other's uh, top eight? Mm. No. Ooh. How alienating. <laughs> oh, that's why they call it top eight. Alienating. That's a good, there's mm. something there. Anyway, mm. how's everyone doing? What's going on? We just uh, finally caught up with Thor Love and Thunder last night. Sweet. All right. Well, we should talk about that as we finally saw it too. Last night? Not last night. Last weekend? Yeah. We went to the movie theater. Yes. The small Our little small community. independent yeah. movie theater downtown. Super cute. Five bucks a ticket. That's less than we paid for our Disney Plus subscription this month. <laughs> <laughs> no one else in the theater. They have BYOB nights. Oh, wow. They have couches. And yeah, it's cool. Anyway, what'd you think of Thor Love and Thunder? I enjoyed it. It didn't blow my socks off, but I actually enjoyed some of the uh, like lovey-dovey aspects of it. I feel like I'm at the <laughs> age where I could enjoy that. Like when it ends and he's taking care of the, the little girl, it's like, oh yeah, my heart is warm. Especially just like the tagline at the end. It pulls on my heartstrings. What did you think, Robin? Yeah. I thought it was pretty good. I have the same feelings as when they announced the casting. I'm not a big Natalie Portman fan. I'm not a big Jane Foster supporter. I have an important question for Robin. Yes. How did you feel about the goats? I loved the goats. <laughs> I knew it. And I, I love that you could tell that they were arriving because the goats would scream. Like, yeah. Thor's here. Ah! <laughs> there were a few well-placed goat moments. I think they might have leaned on it a little hard. But Agreed. A few of them were like, okay, that's hilarious. Yeah, I thought the goats were a good choice. I just think maybe like, Eight to ten percent less screaming goat. <laughs> yeah, and that would have been fine. I mean, it just was maybe like a couple too many. I thought they were great. the The goats, and then I think uh, Korg being attached to Valkyrie's head with a mustache. Oh, yeah. I think that yeah, might be my right. second favorite part about the movie. <laughs> and then Korg and Wayne. I loved Korg. It's like takes unreliable narrator to a. A new meaning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I love that movie. I really, we left the theater and I, yeah, I was just in love and thunder with it. Mm -hmm. Even the cheesy parts. I mean, it was so over the top, especially for like maybe the first act or act and a half. But I don't know, really fun. I loved it. And I loved all the sentimental stuff like you were saying, Royce. And yeah, it really hit hard at the end of the movie a lot. And that was actually Chris Hemsworth's daughter, mm -hmm. the little girl. It was hmm. so sweet. All of their kids were like in the in the cast of kids trapped in the cage. So yeah, that's cool. They definitely leaned into the goofy, the goofy side of the MCU. They just went for it, which is what we expect from Taika Waititi. So I enjoyed watching it. I would watch it again. I think, yeah, there were a couple screaming goat moments where I was like, eh, I don't really need to see this right now. But for the most part, it was good. Yeah, I really loved it. And I kind of went into it knowing 
that it would be my favorite Marvel movie. So I had that going for me already. Wait, are you saying it's your favorite Marvel movie? It's up there. It's really far hmm. up there. I really loved it a lot. I mean, there's one, I would say the one scene that I didn't fully appreciate was like the child soldier scene at the end. Oh, yeah. He like gives all the kids powers to fight. But, but what about the girl who... Who murdered people with her stuffed, stuffed animal? Funny. Come on, that yeah. Was, I, I mean, it was like all part. like funny, but it just—I don't know. It felt a little icky in that moment for me. But that's the only part of the movie that I'm like, oh, I don't know about that bit. But yeah, I was the kind rest of like, why hasn't he just done that every single time they're in a battle? I think that's like the Rick and Morty thing where they're like, that's not time travel, and we can't do this like every episode. Like, yeah. you can only have so much power only when it's convenient. Yeah. Mm. It's a MacGuffin. Or yeah. he's, you know, he's slowly learning how to be the all father. Or he's giving up his selfishness. You know, Thor's story is always like mm. him learning how not to be selfish, right? But also, I want to say that those that run of comic books, uh, Thor, God of Thunder, are really, really good. And if you liked the movie, or if you didn't appreciate a lot of aspects of the movie, I still recommend going to read them. Because they're, I mean, the storyline is the same, but the story elements are pretty different. I really liked it. I've read it before, and then I read it getting ready to go see the movie. Hmm. It's very good. And it's on Hoopla. Plug for Hoopla. Not sponsored. Let me ask you this. How about Rick and Morty? Oh, yeah, we watched, watched, watched the first episode. Yeah. What did you think? It's very canon heavy, which I love. I thought it was pretty good. I, I can't remember any specific moments, but I know that there were several moments where I was like, nice. That's a good yeah. touch. I'm Mr. Frundles. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wait, is that a callback or is that new? I think that's new. But yeah. hilarious that they then go to another universe, like we're just saying. They go to a new universe and they say Parmesan weird. Oh yeah, Parmesan. <laughs> I was in a bit of a uh, it was a bit of a rush job, so they they don't <laughs> pronounce Parmesan right. Parmesan. <laughs> yeah, I really liked it. But I like canon, as we all know. But uh, yeah, I'm excited to see what they do. I hope that they don't like follow that uh, storyline the whole season, and they kind of just maybe bookend it with those through lines but have like fun episodes through just fun random episodes throughout the season yeah because you know that the writers hate writing those canonical episodes I, they said in one interview that this season was going to specifically be more canon heavy oh so. yeah that and that's got to be just because they know that that's what some of the audience wants right because they've like blatantly said that they like we don't go to the citadel because the citadel runs on canon <laughs> yeah <laughs> i love that I mean, didn't they specifically say for last season that they weren't going to do... They literally started off the season by being like, yeah, we're not doing canon this season. We're going to do Rick and Morty's we'll fun, have fun, fun adventures, time, adventures yeah. Yeah, like yeah. we used to do. Not going to worry about canon. Sometimes we'll do fun stuff. So sometimes we might not do anything at all. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they do that a lot, though. I feel like they do that like every season. Breaking the fourth wall thing. And just being like, we're, we're going to do fun, random stuff. Lorelai, what are you into? What am I into? We only have, like, one more episode of Love Island left. Oh, no. I know. Is it coming to an exciting conclusion? Always. Super Who will win? You never Who know what's going to happen next. Pounds? You're going to bring up Lord of the Rings, aren't you, Joey? You can have it. I can have it? Mm -hmm. Oh. Well, okay. What I'm into. The new Lord of the Rings show. We have watched it. I am into it, I think. <laughs> New segment. <laughs> I'm into it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it might be better, actually. That might be a better segment. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I'm not like a super fan of Lord of the Rings. I've I've seen them all. Mm. I generally know the characters. I like kind of know the storyline. I need you to pitch this so Robin will be in because I want to watch Bro. it, but she's not a Lord of the Ringsy. In the grand scheme, uh, like comparing this to the Star Wars universe, this is kind of the Mandalorian of mm. of the Lord of the Rings world, just because it's like a series that you don't necessarily have to really know what's going on. Like you don't have to know the canon in order to know what's going on in the story. So far, the characters are interesting. I think, like, you obviously get more out of it if you're like, oh, this is the character that I know from, like, a thousand years before, but I don't, like, know enough Lord of the Rings, like, the small details. Like, sometimes a character will pop up and Joey's like, oh, my God, it's that, re they're related to that person. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. The names are far too difficult to remember or not conflate one person with another person. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but there's like a few that have come up that are like, oh yeah, that person's in the movies, I know who they are. Or like there's a 
you know, a couple characters where it's like, I'm pretty sure this might become that person, but we don't know yet. Mm. So mm. yeah, it's it's been interesting, I would say. When does Baby Yoda show up? <laughs> when does Baby Sauron show up? I know, they still kind of need the Baby Yoda mm. I don't figure. <laughs> <laughs> the Mandalorian is phenomenal. Some of the best Star Wars ever created, but they've really ruined everything else that w- that people are now like, you know what? You know what the problem was? There was no baby Yoda in this. It's like, it's still good. They're t- like, that it's a completely separate bar. Yeah. But, I mean, it was just like, it wasn't even just that like baby Yoda is adorable. It's just like, it was the thing that made you come back for more, right? Like baby Yoda was why we kept watching. And I'm not sure that this show necessarily has that yet, but we're still going to keep watching it. I think that what this show has that keeps some of us coming back for more is the lore. And so they're on the cusp of creating the rings, right? And the whole battle, the you know, this new battle with Sauron for Middle Earth. But I think the lore is a big draw, especially with like the time frame that they're telling the story in. I mean, but like, I didn't know that they're on the cusp of making the rings, except for the fact that you told me they were. But the show is called The Rings of Power. Yeah, I know what you're saying. but it's, Oh, that's, that's the baby Yoda. I'm just saying that, yeah, you don't, if you don't know the lore, there's still a storyline that you can follow and enjoy. There's still sexy elves. Yeah, there's still some sexy elves. Everyone's pretty dirty, actually. It's like... They're just coming out of this war. Well, I mean, like, not that dirty's not sexy, whatever you want to do. I'm just saying they're not like, I was thinking about it as we were watching the third episode yesterday. Like, in the Fellowship movies, the elves are all shiny and, like, perfect. In this, like, some of them are, but there's a lot of, like, out in the world doing the legwork of, like, fighting evil. Hmm. Lorelai, would you say that if you're not a fan of Lord of the Rings, you would? I don't know where Robin stands is. Like, I can't get her to watch the movies with me. The movies are long and boring. I think that's the part. She's yeah. like, I don't want to go along for the adventure. I like, like fantasy stuff and I like sci-fi stuff. I've only seen the first Lord of the Rings movie and I remember fighting to keep my eyes open because it was so long. They're <laughs> so long and that's, I think... I think I read The Hobbit, but the books are also like, they're well known for being incredibly long and very dense and like, honestly, kind of terrible. Like, yeah. obviously the the like creation of the universe and like the languages and like, there's obviously like a lot of really rich detail, but that doesn't necessarily, I don't know, maybe they were like, oh, we got to like put some of this in the movie. So let's like make them really long and kind of boring. <laughs> People love that they're long, though. I mean, I, I have the director cut. Yeah, the exactly. The longer version, it's like, oh, it was already long. And it's like, no, let's make it even longer. They're two yeah. DVDs each. That's hilarious. You get halfway through the film and it's like, put the other DVD in. Like, <laughs> it's great. It's like Titanic. Yeah, it's, it's I know. Titanic. Yeah. I was going to say, we had the Titanic, like two VHSs that yeah. were like squished together. Ridiculous. Yeah. I think like we're all maybe much more casual fans of Lord of the Rings here than we are Star Wars fans. But I'm really, I'm also really enjoying The Rings of Power. I think it's a really amazing show. I think they're doing a great job with it. They've already have like five years of the show. They've got like five seasons or whatever they're calling it. They're already making so much of this show. And I was watching like the first, maybe by the end of like the second episode, I was like, I'm really enjoying this, but it's not making me want to read the books. But then I listened to some podcasts <laughs> and then specifically shout out to Triad of the Force. They're a wonderful podcast. You should check them out if you haven't, listeners. But they did an episode about the Rings of Power and they were talking about the books and stuff and they're pretty big fans and they made me want to go read the books. So it's always fun to get like the different perspectives of like reasons why other nerds maybe like a thing. But anyway, then I downloaded the Simmer- Silmarillion and started reading that, which is, might be a mistake. TBD. <laughs> we'll see what happens. But yeah, I'm enjoying it. Joey, what are you into? Thank you, Lorelai, for asking me what I'm into. I want to talk about a couple of the D23 things that were announced. But while we're on this topic of like sci-fi and fantasy, I wanted to ask Robin if she's a fan of Willow. Did you watch Willow when you were a kid, Robin? The movie with 
No? no. Anybody here watch Willow? I've heard of it and I've definitely seen, I don't think I've even seen clips of it. I've seen like still mm. images from it and I know of its general existence, but I never watched it. Royce, did you watch Willow? No. Wow, I'm the only one, huh? And it was on a lot when like we were kids. And like, I never had a physical copy of the movie, but it was, I remember it being on a lot and watching it a lot. And I had one friend who was super into it. So I'd watch it with him all the time. But anyway, they are making a sequel and that was announced at D23 yesterday. But I guess if no one's got anything about it, then fine. But Robin, I think you would like Willow. I mean, it's older. So, and it's, I mean, it's really quirky, but it's a lot of fun. I like it a lot. And I think you'd like it. Am I thinking of the right thing? Is it the, one of the Jim Henson ones? kind of around the same time as like Labyrinth, potentially. It's it's kind of, I guess, maybe got the same same like aesthetic stuff going on. Are you, maybe you're thinking of the Dark Crystal? No, I feel no. like I saw, I saw something recently about Willow. Maybe it was that they were making a sequel. Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember there being like any puppetry stuff. It's got Warwick Davis in it and uh, Val Kilmer and other people. Anyway, I really enjoyed it. But yeah, I think same like era of Labyrinth and that stuff and maybe some of the same same like aesthetics. I don't know. Oh, 1988, director Ron Howard. Yes. And yeah. executive produced by George Lucas. Yes, it's a Lucas film endeavor. They mentioned it in some that the documentary. So that's probably oh, on top of mind. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, looks good. Big fan. I what did else? see another D23 thing that I feel like Robin will be excited about. Pocus Pocus 2. Oh, yeah. September 30th. <laughs> Counting down. Yeah. I have mixed emotions. I'm trying not yeah. to be excited because they they are 30 years older. So they yeah. it's not going to be... I don't think it's anyone from the original cast minus the Sanderson sisters. So I'm... Yeah. I am hesitant to be excited. I'm hoping it's good. But I also really hate when there's like a really, really, really good standalone movie and they remake mm -hmm. it or they do a sequel and i understand why they're doing it because people are so hyped on the original mm -hmm. well you're gonna watch it yeah. whether or not it's good or not you're I'm just gonna, gonna watch, watch it, it and then be like it wasn't good yeah they still win i'm i'm skeptical yeah. but i will watch it yeah all right should we talk about the mandalorian season three trailer let's talk about it all right what do we all think we excited to see where it goes baby yoda got a new pod so I'm excited for him on that front. This might be the most excited I've ever been for a Mandalorian <laughs> season. Wow. Is it just because of anticipation from the end of the last season or because the stuff in the trailer got you all amped up? I mean, the stuff in the trailer, you guys saw Babu Frick, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I screamed out loud when I saw him in the trailer. <laughs> and then... uh I laughed out loud when you still haven't told me what they're technically called. The the tree full of salacious bee crumbs. Oh yeah, they haven't they have a name. Does anyone know Lizard what they're called? Lizard monkeys. Salacious bee crumbs. Yeah. yeah. Robin was so excited. Like I was watching something else on YouTube. I didn't know that all this stuff had dropped yet. And like Robin's giggling like a schoolgirl on the couch. I'm like, what the hell's going on? And she's like, You gotta watch this trailer. <laughs> Listen to this. It was very out of character for Robin in Star Wars. Like, Robin not really into the, you know, animated show they announced or like Andor, but like Mando season three, she's like jumping, jumping for joy, which is a good thing yeah. that there's enough stuff that you could be excited about something. Yeah. Well, I feel like this season is kind of what we've been waiting for and maybe why they put all of the like Baby Yoda, Mando reuniting into the Boba Fett show is that it's literally, it seems like it's pretty much Mando and Baby Yoda like roaming around doing stuff, having adventures. Just we're going to just like have some classic buddies. Mando and Baby Yoda adventures. Yeah. Exactly. Pretty yeah. much. <laughs> All I've been waiting for. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that there are going to be, is it in Andor that there's going to be little Babu Fricks and Zelens, I think they're called. They're like species name. Anyway, uh, I think there's also going to be several of them in Andor. So that's that the baby Yoda of Andor. Hyped about that. Was that in the trailer? Did I miss that? Somebody had it mentioned that been... there were more Babu Fricks somewhere. Yeah. So that might might be it. Yeah. You, you got to fill the trailer it. with that. And then I'm going to be hyped for Andor. Hey, hey. <laughs> yeah. I just need to put the damn sound, sound bite in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm pretty excited for Mando. Also, I think it looks great. It was neat to see Bo-Katan and... What's going on with Mandalore and the bullshit? You're a Mandalorian, no more gatekeeping nonsense. I hate that 
whatever. What's she called? The armorer. The armorer. Yeah. I don't like that. She's yeah. mean. Anyway. Even the way she says it, like, you took off your helmet. The worst thing you could do. Yeah. I'm so offended. Well, it's such it, a silly thing for a, like a religious creed to be obsessive over like, never take off your helmet. What, <laughs> yeah. In the trailer, doesn't is it Bo-Katan that says something like your cult ruined? Yeah. I forget the rest of it, but like your cult ruined everything. Do, like divided <laughs> our, our culture. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it really, I don't know, you get, it's uh, featured heavily in the Clone Wars. <laughs> But yes. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see, like, it, it seems like he's maybe accepted nowhere by any Mandalorian, whether it's the ones led by Bo-Katan or the, the Death Watch. Yeah, sad. Seemingly sad. But maybe we'll get to see some cool adventures. I'm broadly excited because we all love Mandalorian. He's a cool character. And Baby Yoda's back, so there's that. It's great. They're obviously like, they're a clan of two. They kind of belong together. But I will still never understand why the end of season two, he gives him away and you think he's going to now go on to lead the Mandalorians and be like grow as a person and Grogu can be a Jedi. And then they undo that in Book of Boba Fett, which intertwines with season one and two of Mandalorian. And then we start season three of Mandalorian and, ba and Yoda's just back or Grogu's back. It's one of those like retroactive things that maybe they realize they're better together if that's a marketing thing, you know, for like toys or girlfriends. I don't know, <laughs> but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I really wish he was just on his own and still separated from Grogu and they could have played out that like tension, you know, over a longer period of time instead of just undoing that in Boba Fett's show for two episodes. Like, I know this is old territory that we've hashed out, but I'll never understand that. It's a very like, Never mind. That wasn't a good idea, but we already put out that content. Undo. I'm, maybe I'm yeah. the only one here. It's just, just kind of weird to me. And then if you never watch Bo Book of Boba Fett, you, hopefully they recap before you watch Mandalorian. It's just a little weird. Yeah, I think that they're trying to and counting on people watching it all, you know, watching the like Mandoverse. I do uh, agree. I, I guess, like, I've come around to the idea of him not being out on his own without Grogu. I do think it feels a little bit weird the way they did it. Like, you can never binge season two directly to three, presumably. Yeah, but maybe that they maybe they put those episodes in Book of Boba Fett because they wanted to skip to this point in Mando. Right, like, Wh which is a retroactive. The, the original thing. intention, right, the original intention was to have it uh, be the beginning of season three of Mando. But in order to, like, get where they wanted to go more efficiently in the season, maybe they put it in, or maybe they did it in Book of Boba Fett to get people to watch Book of Boba Fett. It does feel a little disjointed. Maybe upon, like, maybe going back and binging everything, it would feel better. But yeah, I agree. It does, like, feel a little strange the way they broke it up. Hopefully there's a really good reason why Grogu needs to be there to get through the minds of Mandalore and, like, purge himself of his sins like Grogu's got to lift a rock out of the way like he couldn't do it without a Jedi by his side sort of thing yeah like maybe he's the key to reuniting people because you don't have to be a real Mandalorian here's Grogu you know that might I, be part I, of it I think yeah maybe but I also think it's a very family thing from both sides Din Djarin is being cast out from seemingly every sect of Mandalorian and Grogu is Cast out of the Jedi? Uh, cast out of the Jedi or left the Jedi or maybe a bit of both yeah. because of the way Luke treated him. So they're coming mm. together as their own like found family clan yeah. of two. And it's a really, I think that that theme is really incredible. So I love the direction that it went in. But yeah, it feels like maybe that was supposed to be the beginning of season three and they put it in Book of Boba Fett, mm. which... I don't know, is fine. But yeah, feels a little disjointed, which we've said. Yeah, I guess kind of a non-point. Robin's tired yeah. of hearing about it. Lorelai's <laughs> tired of hearing about it. Baby Yoda's back. We're getting the band back together for another album. Just like Tatooine Rhapsody. Speaking of lifting rocks, Roy said Grogu would lift a rock. <laughs> Obi-Wan. Also happened Kenobi. in Obi-Wan. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they rhyme. There's something really wonderful there where in The Last Jedi, Luke's like, it's not about lifting rocks. And then in Obi-Wan Kenobi, Obi-Wan Kenobi was basically like, hold my fucking Jawa juice. <laughs> and he lifts all the rocks. But that's at the end. Let's start at the beginning. <laughs> I'm going to talk. And then let's all talk. So, Obi-Wan Kenobi. 
I have to say that this show was almost everything I wanted it to be. Everything I hoped it would be, I guess I should say. We had talked about it leading up to the show. I really wanted the story of Obi-Wan dealing with his trauma, dealing with the after effects of fighting this war and losing and losing your brother slash son slash best friend and losing all your friends and family and losing the people that you fought side by side with for the entirety of the Clone Wars. And it was that emotional story. And I loved it. And emotional and, you know, action. We'll get to that somewhat. But in that sense, a lot of this show was exactly what I hoped it would be. And something that I started thinking about partway through the show, maybe I started feeling this way finally with this show, is that I'm starting to think of this as like a real cohesive saga, like not just discussed as in three trilogies. What I felt this show did was really like glue everything together. So it's not just like the prequels, the original trilogy, and the sequels. We're like filling all these gaps, which has obviously been happening, but it really started to feel like it for me during this show, which I love. I love that. What did you think, Lorelai? I liked it. I don't think as per usual. I didn't have as much emotional investment in it (laughs) as some other people in the group or (laughs) room. (laughs) Um, (laughs) you know, it covers a period of time in the like movie series where it's a big gap and yeah, it covers a big time period where we don't really know how we got from point A to point B. So I liked that it's like kind of filling in some of those gaps and in the meantime, also introducing some new interesting characters and like some of the more important details that like, you know, because you've watched everything and I don't know because I haven't watched everything. (laughs) But yeah, and then it did have, you know, it had those moments that were just like zingers when, you know, when you finally like see Anakin's face like through Mm. the helmet and just like drove home the pain that that would have caused Obi-Wan and to like see his friend end up like that. So... Yeah, I enjoyed that. And that it was because of him. Yeah. That Obi-Wan was blaming him. Well, because of him. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. And Anakin, I mean, I guess I just want to touch on a couple of things. That scene when Anakin, when Vader is like, this isn't your fault. I killed Anakin Skywalker is such an incredible moment, I think. Like, that's it. That's when Obi-Wan loses faith that his friend could be redeemed. That's when, that's what leads to... Obi-Wan telling Luke that his father's dead, murdered by Darth Vader. That's what leads to Obi-Wan telling Luke that his father can't be redeemed. That Mm -hmm. incredible moment in the show, a very, another like, high emotion moment. But that Vader's taking that guilt away. Such a blessing and a curse there that Vader's taking that guilt away from Obi-Wan. A, because, you know, Obi-Wan has been feeling guilty, and B, because Vader needs to believe that he killed Anakin Skywalker. What? How about um, little Leia, Lorelai? Oh, she was so cute. She was great. I thought she was very well acted, for one. Just really well done. I don't, I obviously don't know the actress's name, but she Vivian was Vivian so, Blair. Vivian Blair. Kudos to you. Like, she was just so good and, like, really did sort of, you know, especially since, I mean, Carrie Fisher died, like, very recently. Like, she really brought the like spirit of the character into like this little tiny person. So yeah, I really enjoyed that. 100%. She was a mini Princess Leia, a mini Carrie Fisher. Yeah. I mean, man, Carrie Fisher would certainly be proud of the job. Yeah. Yeah, I loved her a lot. And then the first like getting to see her on, I was very surprised. Were you all surprised by little Leia? Yeah, that was, that was a pretty well-kept secret. Yeah. Because I tweeted right after the first episode, I tweeted like about how surprised I was. And someone commented and was like, um, actually, that was all leaked. And I was like, "Okay, well, obviously, I don't pay attention to the leaks. So but it's good that it was a surprise for all of us because that makes it much more fun. That was super surprised. And they like panned Alderaan and you're like, what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was awesome. I like. Yeah. 
just heart swelling. I really love the scene where they're having the meeting with all like the cousins and like other political figures. And she's talking to that one kid and she's like, he's mean to droids. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Leia loves droids. And I don't know if you guys saw the documentary for a Jedi's journey or Jedi's mm. return, whatever. But they interview her and she's like, I learned to read from Star Wars books and I fell in love with R2-D2 when he was on the page. And like the actress also loves droids. And like, yeah. I'm sure that plays into why it's so, why she plays it, you know, so earnestly and believably. Yeah, I just love that natural. part. He's mean to droids. Like they're droids. Yeah. But you could still be nice to him. I love that whole scene, especially when she's like, you don't believe any of this. You're just saying what your father says. Yeah. It's like, yeah, that's, that's the, that's the actual like, political state of our world at this point. So, yeah. Yeah, she was perfect. All of her tone was perfect with the way she delivered those things that you're like, yeah, that is just the right amount of sass. <laughs> yeah. Grandfather, maybe. <laughs> yeah, she's great. What did you two think of the show? I think the strongest thing is like that battle between the two of them. Like if nothing else, like it could have just been that that scene where like, what did Vader and Obi-Wan talk about in that off period of time? Like, was it, the first time they saw each other on the Death Star, which kind of makes sense. Like, if you didn't have Obi-Wan, like, you could still jump right to A New Hope, I feel like. Obviously, mm -hmm. when they wrote... wrote We've Revenge done it for years. Of, yeah, when they wrote Revenge of the Sith, that was the point. You're like, they kind of bookend to each other. But it is interesting for him, like you said, to see him and be absolved of like, no, you didn't kill me. And that totally turns around Obi-Wan's life because he's like down in the dumps, which I think is kind of what we predicted when we first talked about Obi-Wan, we're like, what is he doing? He's just going to be like sad, lonely, and depressed in the desert. And he basically was. And uh, I'm going to plug that Kai Patterson edit one more time because <laughs> in the very beginning of it, he takes out like all the dialogue and whatnot. And you just see Obi-Wan like bumming around Tatooine. And it is just powerful to see him like broken down, you know? Yeah. When you're like, you were once a great Jedi Knight, you know? And when he tells that to Luke in A New Hope, he still is just like a hermit, a crazy old man, you know? Mm. And I love I love seeing that like dichotomy of like the broken down dude and the hero or like the breaking bad, you know, chemistry teacher and drug kingpin, you know, <laughs> that journey is always satisfying. But then for him to meet meet with Anakin again, I don't know, like it's kind of weird. They do that battle and then in another couple of years they meet up again, like those two lightsaber battles, like don't really correlate, but you have to suspend some disbelief, I think there. Oh, yeah. But that's what the whole series was. So they can meet again and Obi-Wan could look to the future instead of being depressed about his past, which is like, that's fucking life. That's 101. Like, uh -huh. stop beating yourself up. Like, you are better than the failures of your past. And he mm -hmm. needed to be absolved of that from Anakin himself or Vader himself. When he's like, you're not even Anakin anymore. Like, you're Darth, you know? And I think they should explore that more in Star Wars too. The like, maybe they will in that Tales of the Jedi with Dooku, Joe. Like, that would be yeah. cool if they go there. But like, that calling him Darth would be like, you know, some sort of like an insult of sorts, you know? Like, you're no longer like Grand Master Jedi Knight. You're a Darth. Yeah. Like, you're tainted now or whatever. Like, maybe that's more powerful. People harp on that line too. Like, why does he call him Darth? It's like calling him Mr. But that's my headcanon yeah. for that line anyway. And that's what I think we live for. It's like that moment of the show. And if you didn't like shed a tear for that, like, I don't know, man. I don't think you are human. You might be an android. <laughs> Yeah, it's classic Obi-Wan being a troll, right? He was back to his old troll, troll Obi-Wan ways. Goodbye, Doth. Troll Obi-Wan. Uh, it's, it's actually Vader. <laughs> um, but th it was so interesting because that scene, it's been so easy to consider Anakin and Vader two separate entities. The idea that Vader killed Anakin has been implanted in our minds since the original trilogy. And so going forward, consuming all of the other content that I've consumed, including the movies and the shows and the comic books, it's been very, even, yeah, even the books and the comic books, it's been very easy to separate Vader and Anakin. But that scene where it becomes less easy for, or, or where it becomes more easy for Obi-Wan to separate them. It became less easy for me. It blended the two together where Vader and Anakin seemed much more as truly Anakin being down the wrong path and less of Anakin having been killed by Vader and had become someone entirely different to go down that path. When he says, you didn't kill Anakin, I did. It made that statement so untrue for me and just made me believe that that's what Vader has to believe in order to go on existing, which 
Well, it's the same thing Obi Wan, which has was to incredible. Do. Yeah, they like exactly. the parallels with with Ben. Yeah, yeah, and then you get to see a, an actual face behind the mask. Like even in the original trilogy, you don't see Vader's face or Anakin's face until the very end of the series. You know, so like you said, like you can watch the original trilogy now and like paint that new head cannon behind it a real cannon now. I guess you know. I want to talk about. I was going to bring this up. I'm sorry, Robin. Uh, I'm just going to. She's chomping just, at the bit. She has a really gonna, hot, hot take to bring. I'm just going to divulge a little bit. The end of Return of the Jedi, Luke removes Anakin's mask. The removal of that mask is now the culmination of three, the three most important battles of Anakin slash Vader's life. His battle with Obi Wan destroys one side of his mask. His battle with Ahsoka Tano destroys a side of his mask. And then the third and final battle with Luke, who actually gets to remove his mask and see his old face. Like the steps that they're taking to get there, the symbolism there, the entire story between like half his mask and the whole mask. And that neither of those two, like Dave Filoni, when the episode of Star Wars Rebels, oh, not the Clone Wars. I bet you thought I was going to go Clone Wars. The episode of Star Wars Rebels when Ahsoka and Vader battle, you know, I think it was right after that Dave Filoni said there was no, there could be no way, there couldn't even be an inkling that Ahsoka could turn Vader because that has to be saved for Luke. Right. So the fact that now they've had these different battles and it all culminates with Luke actually finally revealing Vader's whole face, like it was all steps to get there. And it's just incredible to me. And the three most important people in his life got him there. It, a little bit. They got a little part of him there each step of the way. Is really amazing storytelling to me and amazing Star Wars. And I love it a lot. Yeah. Dude, you should also pin, though, with uh, the Mustafar fight and the Death Star fight. Because Obi-Wan thinks he killed Anakin. And then he comes back as like an evil guy. And Darth Vader thinks he kills Obi-Wan. But Obi-Wan's like, bro, I've been training with Qui-Gon. I will become a Force ghost and I will train Luke from the Force. I'll tell him to go to Yoda. It's, yeah. it's, all, it's all poetry. It all rhymes. Yeah. Robin, you got to follow up this love letter somehow. Tell us how much... Let me, uh, let me ask a leading question, Robin. Tell us how much you loved Obi-Wan <laughs> Kenobi. I didn't hate it as much as I thought I would. <laughs> that's great. That is really, that's really great news because we haven't, so as a little preface, I'm sorry I'm talking so much and I don't mean to take away from Robin. I'm just saying, just want to say like we as a group haven't talked about this much. We, I don't know if we on purpose saved it for the podcast or not, but that's good to know. I didn't know that, Robin. I think that's as positive of a review as I can give it. <laughs> <laughs> I liked the droids, which is... Mm -hmm. Typically what Shock I like to no most. one. Yeah. <laughs> Ned Ned B. Lola. Yeah. I, I uh, think I like Lola. Lola the best. Uh what about Frick? Who was that? The taxi cab driver. Oh, the guy that ratted him out? Yeah. No. Wait, what was his name? Freck. Is that Zach Braff? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was terrible. Yeah. He was a really bad character. I don't know. I the the droids were my favorite part, and I didn't totally hate the entire series. It's the exact thing that I've said about most of their recent releases, which is I don't feel like it's a source of information that we needed filled in. We could have just been like, Obi-Wan fucked off for a few years and then came back to train Luke and fight Darth Vader and become a Force ghost. It almost felt more like, th like they were giving Ewan McGregor and Hayden Christensen an another shot of like, put your final stamp back on Star Wars sort of thing. And it was a nice kind of family moment. But it felt like they, they wanted to bring them back for the people who actually liked the prequels, who wanted to see them in that role again and I I get that but I I don't like the prequels and I don't I didn't need to see them. Okay, so one of our biggest talking points on our like trailer breakdown or trailer reaction was we talked forever about the stupid grand inquisitor who wasn't even in the fucking show and they stab him and he disappears and everyone freaked out cuz he didn't look good and he wasn't even in the damn show. What a waste of fucking time. You made him look like <laughs> shit and you didn't even put him in the show unless maybe they deleted him afterwards. But we were like, maybe Robin will be stoked about the evil bad guy. And you were like, yeah, I like evil bad guys. What did you think of him after seeing him in it for one and a half episodes? I think I would have appreciated the show more if he was the bad guy throughout the entire series. And every 30 seconds, it wasn't like, Darth Vader's coming. 
He's here. <laughs> I, I feel him. Darth Vader's here. Everybody hide. Vader's back. Yeah, I think we were talking about it like, what if it's just an Inquisitor show and then it was not an Inquisitor show, really? That would have been cool. And I think it would have been cool if like the last episode, they maybe like briefly teased Darth Vader. They showed him for like a couple seconds. Obi-Wan's fighting the Inquisitors and Darth Vader's the boss, right? Yeah, something nah. like that. But instead it was like the Grand Inquisitor is there for like half a second. The entire series is Darth Vader and Obi-Wan playing phone tag, basically. <laughs> yeah, there's a little cat and mouse going on. Yeah, and I and same thing. Like I think the girl who played Leia did a really great job, but I thought she was a really great actress. But I think after like what two or three, there's a lot of Leia. After after what like two or three episodes, I was like, I hope the entire series is not just oh no, Leia ran away again. She's she kidnapped, kidnapped again. Yeah, Obi Wan, go get Leia. It again. was a very yeah villain of the weeky kind of plot line there. Yeah, so I felt like there's a lot of that going on. We just watched a recap to like try to remind ourselves, and like half of the recap is like Obi Wan being like, he's here for me. Go on without me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Like, that happens, like, three or four times that he, like, is sacrificing himself to, like, let everybody else get away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, oh, surprise, he actually gets away with everyone after all, and he's yeah. he's safe, and so is everyone else. Wow. <laughs> it would have been really cool if they saved him for, like, the very, very end. Isn't mm -hmm. that what they did in, was that Rogue One? He yeah. shows up, like, right at the very end, and you're like, oh, shit. Like, that was a cool moment. Yeah. And I yeah. think had they done something similar, like, maybe teased it, maybe if Obi-Wan's, like, I can feel him or something like that. And he could tell like he's he's getting close, but he never like really sees him until the very end. Yeah, well, then they meet in the middle and then they meet again. There's a couple, like you said, there's a few false starts. Yeah, I think they should have should have saved him. Well, that's the difference between like, is this a TV show or is it a movie? And you're like, it's a mini series. <laughs> like, uh, it's not really either or. So then you get like some fluff, you know, and you get some things yeah. that are rushed. There's like a, mm -hmm. a weird spectrum there. If it's not 24 episodes, like what the hell is Andor gonna, like that's insane. Or, <laughs> Or you get these other shows like it's She-Hulk and they're half an hour episodes. I haven't seen it, but it's weird the era we live in where you have TV shows that are streaming and they're not long and they're not short and it's it's, it's just stuff. We're putting it out. Yeah. What about Aunt Beru and Uncle Owen? Eh. Eh? Okay, what about Reba? Eh. Who? The Inquisitor. The who? Third Th sister. Third sister. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I didn't like her either. I did feel bad that everyone was like hating on her. Were they just hating on her because she's black? Was that the whole yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah. No, it was all racism. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like I have no issue with the fact that she's a black actress and I think she played the role well, but I didn't like the character. Mm. It has nothing to do with the way that she she played her. It's just I think the way they wrote the character. I didn't particularly care for it felt a little bit like petty almost. And I didn't really appreciate that. Like she could have been a really cool, badass character, but I feel like they kind of like kept, kept her down for Compressed some reason. It down. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, wh whose story are you telling? Is it Reva's story or Obi-Wan's? Like that's the well, thing. Like it's called Obi-Wan. We're going to take two episodes to talk about baby Yoda training with Luke. <laughs> yeah, I think so. We, we do tend, I mean, we do tend to get boxed into where we're like, it's called Obi-Wan, but I think it's <laughs> okay for them to tell other stories that are intertwined. I think it is. It, it was also like a, a like you can't, I think it's you can't necessarily tell this part of Obi-Wan's story without bringing in Darth Vader, whereas like with Rogue One, you could tell. I mean, with Rogue One, it was about Jin and, and Cassian and the Rebellion. That was almost but, like a post credit scene, really. Yeah, but I do really like Reva. I think, yeah, there was like a lot of racism surrounding the like acceptance or not acceptance of her in the show as a character. But I also, like, at the end of the show, her redemption was, I thought her redemption was really great. This is why I think, Royce, when you were talking about the edit a couple of weeks ago, you were like, they cut out the stuff with Reva and Luke. I don't know how much they cut. I still haven't watched it, but that is She's really important. She's not all out of it, but they cut That's some of it. That's a really important part for me because I love her redemption. And honestly, in my mind, in my, like, mental concept of Star Wars on screen, it is one of the only true redemption arcs in on-screen Star Wars. Like, we talk about Vader all the time, and everyone's always like, who had a better redemption arc, Vader or Zuko from Avatar The Last Airbender? And yes, Vader was redeemed, but it, it happened in, like, 10 seconds. It's There's more nuance to it than that, but on screen, it just, like, he threw the Emperor down the pit, and everything <laughs> happened. 
With Riva, they like told her story and told her trauma. And then at the end, she ended up this way and then was redeemed and broke down and was redeemed. And that to me was such an amazing piece of storytelling because we don't see it a lot that fleshed out. Ben Solo, kind of, mm. you know, I know that there's more to it than this, but again, like on screen, there's a little bit of time where he gets redeemed. I just felt so much more in-depth with Riva than it has before. I do think that Lucasfilm has a problem that really... I don't want to say, like, amplifies the vo- like these clickbait and racist stuff, but they have a real issue with casting people of color as villains, regardless of whether they get redeemed. I mean, Riva, yes, she got redeemed. I'm counting James Earl Jones as Vader. Lando betrays his friends. Trilla from uh, Jedi Fallen Order. Moff Gideon. The list goes on and on. And like, come on, stop doing that. Obviously, there's going to be this racism that that, that j- just takes these characters and, and drags their names through the dirt. But like, you don't have to keep casting people of color as villains. So just stop, stop doing that. I mean, I think probably my favorite part was when Leia, I think it was when she initially first gets kidnapped and she's got Lola in her pocket and she takes Lola out and is trying to get Lola to save her. But then it gets really sad really fast. Those first like few seconds where you're like, oh God, this droid's going to save her. That's pretty cool. This teeny tiny little <laughs> yeah. droid. Yeah. And then she gives Lola to Obi-Wan because she's like, Lola helps me when I'm scared. And then Obi-Wan mm. gives Lola back like, oh my God. It was, this was the most emotional Star Wars of all Star Wars. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. My favorite moment was when they're in the, I don't know, I guess I was going to say like underwater hallway, but I guess they're all underwater hallways in the Fortress Inquisitorious. But when they're <laughs> pseudo escaping and Obi-Wan's like getting his groove back and he's using his lightsaber, <laughs> you know, and he's... Yeah. He's using it like a baseball bat and he's like swinging it and the lasers are like going where he wants them to go. Like that was a really cool moment that we saw Obi-Wan in Phantom Menace with Qui-Gon and they're like so badass killing like battle droids and they're, they got super speed and they're like in their prime. That was a cool moment of like, he's a bum on Tatooine and he forgot how to use the force and he doesn't remember all the keyboard shortcuts and his password <laughs> to his Jedi Academy email. And all of a sudden, he's, like, getting it back when, like, he needs to be protecting Leia the most and Tala. And he's like, the stakes are high. And he just saw all the Jedi in the tomb. And, like, just something as simple as, like, his lightsaber work, which is, like, something they teach the Padawans. Like, here's how you hold your lightsaber and deflect a blaster bolt with the training thing. Like, yeah. such a rudimentary Jedi skill to be able to use your lightsaber to defend yourself. And he was getting it back, you know, and he's doing some of the fancy moves. And that was my favorite scene when you're, like, he's getting his HP up. He's got yeah. his star power ready and he's going to save it for one special moment. The final battle. Is, it's going to be one of these. Yeah. One of those. That's not going to translate to I the just podcast. Did the, the Obi-Wan pose. I just did the Obi-Wan lightsaber pose. Everybody <laughs> listening. I think my favorite part in general was sort of the like Leia, Obi-Wan, buddy, buddy. Like, Agreed. yeah. How they just like are friends and how she's like already giving him shit for being old. And it, gives a lot of context to in like the original Star Wars like why is she going to Obi-Wan for help in the first like help me Obi-Wan you're my only hope and it's like it provides all of the context for that moment where she's like I guess I don't know if they're gonna make a sequel to this series but like he's this person who like saved her back in the day and when she's like I need someone to come save me like help me again this is the person i think of and she's been like thinking about him in that way for her whole life like i think i just really liked how it really was like a lot of parts in the show were kind of calling back to that moment and like providing context for that so that was probably my favorite yeah agreed good choice and why she names her son ben i know yeah so that moment in uh, The Force Awakens already hits me the hardest. Mm-hmm. But now going back to watch it, it will hit even it's like, harder. Oh yeah, they were best friends yeah. for like a week and he's, they like saved each other and yeah. And then Obi-Wan tells her all the qualities she has from her parents and he's like, these are I qualities know. you get from your mom and your father. Yeah, it's, that's awesome. Yeah. 
I so that's one of my favorite moments, Royce. And another is when he's referring back. It's earlier in the series where he's telling uh, little Leia that she's headstrong and stubborn, which is reminding him of someone he used to know, which could either be Padme, her mom, or, you know, Satine, which was like Obi-Wan's love. Mm -hmm. So I really liked that, like, as a Clone Wars fan, I could interpret that scene multiple ways. But yeah, I would say some of the greatest stuff was the Obi-Wan Leia stuff. Mm -hmm. Honestly... There's a lot of great emotional storytelling. There's a lot of great action. The scene that really lives in my head rent-free is one of the very last scenes between Leia and Bale. And she shows up with, like, the blaster holder on her. And she's like, this is how I'm going to do things. And Bale's like, well, then we'll do it together. And I just, like, ah. Bale and Brea. I, th- I also really like Bale and Brea in this. That could probably be a whole other conversation. Is Brea the, his wife? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah and, then, and then Leia's got a gun in A New Hope, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's now, shooting stormtroopers, like... Yeah, that's, I mean, that just, I mean, uh, it's so cool to see the events that led to Leia. And then Tala, I think there's one point where, like, Leia asks Tala why she does what she does. And she's like, people... People with power need to help those without it or something like that. And you could just see that that's the line that makes Leia who she is in the future. It's an incredible, I really loved a lot of stuff about this show. Surprise questions for everyone. (laughs) Surprise questions for all. Robin, we're going to start with you. You get your own very special surprise question this time. Hooray. (laughs) Hooray. Robin? If you were going to get a Star Wars tattoo, what would your Star Wars tattoo be? R2-D2. Wow. Succinct, quick, very nice. I almost Why? got an R2-D2 tattoo like <laughs> nice. seven or eight years ago. Because that was when I, I didn't really start watching it until like seven or eight years ago. And that was, I, I think, the character that I initially really liked the most. And I think for being just a droid, I think R2-D2 has a lot of personality. And I always found that to be really interesting and really funny. For sure. Oh, that's fun. Now I want an R2-D2 tattoo. (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) Royce, your question is, who's your favorite Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle? (laughs) Uh, Probably Michelangelo. Sweet. Michelangelo is a party dude. (laughs) I have been really on a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle kick lately, and I just read some Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle comics, and yeah, they're great. I think Michelangelo is also my favorite. And Lorelai, a very special surprise question for you that comes from Brian from Pink Milk. No way! Just for me? Just for you. Wow. If we had a Love Island podcast, Mm -hmm. what would it be called? (gasps) Oh, wow. It'd be called, I've got a text. <laughs> I think that's what it would be called. How do you put the accent on the... I don't know, but... <laughs> we'll have to, you'd have to figure, it figure out that out. Great. Hey, guess what? I didn't have one for me, but I answered most of it. I'll, I'll answer yours. Uh, Robin, I would probably get a yellow lightsaber. Royce Michelangelo is also my favorite. And Lorelai, I think my, like, I think what I would consider to be our Love Island podcast would just be something like, ew, gross. I was also thinking, like, the villa. <laughs> yeah. Casa. Casa Amor. Podcasa. Podcasta Amor. Amor. <laughs> yeah, no, that's it. That's the one. All right, we did it. Yeah, I don't know how to pose that question to our listeners, but if you have a favorite <laughs> Ninja Turtle, a tattoo of a fandom that you would put onto yourself, and a really trashy reality show that you'd love to start a podcast about, let us know on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, or even YouTube. Just search Krypton to Alderaan. We would love to hear from you. Joey just put up a brand new video unboxing some comic books on YouTube. It's got his face in it. It's not just a podcast. It's a YouTube (laughs) video. We're living in the future. So check that out. You can even pew, pew, pew us an email at krypton2alderaan at gmail.com and leave us a rating wherever you're listening if you're on a podcast app. Thanks for listening to the show. I've been Royce. I've been Robin. I've been Lorelai. And I've been the Grand Inquisitor. And we've been... Krypton Krypton to... 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 To...